Welcome, Patrick. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you all for attending. On a <laughs> Friday evening, it is the start of the weekend, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yet here you are. I'm, I'm delighted and honored to see all of you. And thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. That clip from Logan, I've seen the film four times, makes me want to see it even again one more time tonight. We're going to be talking about that later on, but I, it, it kind of brings to mind um, something about your characters that I always have found interesting, which is that uh, even your strongest leaders have a vulnerability to them, have a humanity, and your lions in winter still have a roar. I'm wondering if as you're getting ready for the performance, kind of thinking about it, uh, taking it apart, do you think about what makes these men tick? And what's your process for that? It's always different. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I left drama school in 1959, I had a process because we were taught a process. This is how you prepare to play a role. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very rigorous and very detailed and very exact. Uh, I, I, my life consists of boxes and has done for years and years and years because I'm always moving and so there are always boxes cluttering up wherever I live. And I opened one of them and I found my drama school notebooks. And uh, I read through uh, because we had to write down what this acting process was. And part of it was you read, you read the play all the way through, first of all, for time. When is it happening? Then you read it all again for place. Where is it happening? You know, actually, I've never, ever talked about this before. This is the first <laughs> time. And, and then we read it, oddly, eccentrically, for weather. <laughs> because the principal of my school believed that all of us are profoundly affected by the yeah. atmospheric conditions yeah, yeah. surrounding us. And we would write notes on all of these things. There would be, where are we, when are we, and what's the weather like? <laughs> um, and then we would read the play again. I mean, it was all about reading, reading, reading the play over and over and over again. Um, you would write down, what do people say about the character when he's present, when he's there? What do people say about the character when he's absent? What does the character say about himself? And the, all these things, and so pages and pages and pages of notes. And I do remember the principal, and we had a dazzlingly brilliant principal of, of my school, which was the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. I, 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 oh, fans of Bristol, good, a great school. And I was very happy to be in Bristol because I would have just lost myself in London. In those days, I would anyway. Um, and of course, this man, whose name was Duncan Ross, went on to be for many, many years the head of the, uh, of the Seattle um, rep. And also, he continued to teach as well. So he had a, quite a strong influence on American theater as well as he had on many of us um, who, who were graduates of, uh, of Bristol Old Vic. Um, but he said to us at one point, it's tiresome writing all this stuff down. But now, at the age of, I was 17, you have to do it because this is the only way we can lock in. And they really talked about locking in this process of how do you prepare from the script to play the role. A time will come, he said, when you won't have to do this. You'll just absorb it as you've worked more and more and read more and more plays and more diverse plays, uh, the, the process will become second nature, which I'm happy to say is where I've ended up right now. <laughs> um, but there, there, sometimes I, I, I will say about a scene, I'll say to the director, what is the weather like in this scene? <laughs> Because I don't know. Um, and it was linked to it was, um, you see, you've got me talking about yeah. my stu studies of 58 years ago. Um, we, we also followed a pretty rigorous, uh, basically Stanislavski method, mm -hmm. um, the method, yeah. 
uh, not exactly as it was taught here in the United States in the actor's studio and so forth, although the actor's studio by a second-hand process had a huge impact on me because when I was 13, I went to the cinema. The cinema was my, was my only entertainment. Um, uh, we had no television in my home. Uh, in fact, uh, I was 23 when we got our first television. So, and by the way, there was nothing to watch anyway. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> right. you know, one channel, right. <laughs> which started at seven o'clock in the evening and ended at 11. You had four hours of TV. Um, so movies. Picture House, and it was a great time, the 50s for movie theaters, they were all flourishing then. And uh, it was a time when the transition from black and white to Technicolor mm -hmm. was fully uh, engaged. And um, I loved Technicolor. Yeah. Uh, my life was um, drab, uh, was challenging and at times a little dangerous. And I didn't like it much. So the cinema gave me the perfect escape from my own life, which I didn't like at all. Um, and uh, I, I remember, and I still occasionally get it, especially in airplanes. <laughs> Have you ever seen a movie in an airplane that you didn't like? <laughs> That's true. You have. Oh, are you a critic? No, you're an actress. Um, I have this, this theory that if ever I were to produce a movie, which is unlikely, but it might happen, um, I would have the critics' screening of the movie mm -hmm. happen in a 747. <laughs> We'd get them all on board, and there would be champagne, and they would all have their own screen in front of them. And then we would show them the movie. Because in my experience, I have never seen a movie in a plane that I didn't love. <laughs> my friend from Star Trek days, uh, Jonathan Frakes, used to say, you know Pat, what Patrick's favorite movie is? People would say, no, what, what is it? I was thinking Elia Kazan or, you know. Steven Spielberg. Um, no, it's actually, honey, I blew up the kids. <laughs> because I came back from a trip uh, one Monday morning when we were shooting the series and said, I have seen the most amazing <laughs> movie. <clears throat> um, and the, <laughs> the other thing, it, it must be something about the altitude. <laughs> and the champagne, I think probably. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I drink on planes far less than I used to. Uh -huh. I'm finding that it's actually a much better way to yeah, fly. Yeah. This, this is what That's you need. Water is the way to go. Yeah. Um, but I cry at movies. Now, you're going to really, as somebody who's a, a movie fan, um, I, I've flown four times on British Airways this month. That's my airline of choice when you've got a knighthood uh, flight. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, you know, doors are open, the carpets are laid or anything, but there's always the chance of a fancy upgrade, you know? And, you, you get the extra pillow at least, I'm sure, right? Uh, exactly. Right, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, uh, your glass refilling right, before yeah. you've even thought you needed yeah, right. it refilling. <laughs> Um, and the nice thing is flying with the same airline, you get to know cabin crew and you see the same people all the time. Um, but on, what's today? Friday, I said Friday already. Um, on Wednesday, I flew to Chicago from London and it's still October. And I had thrown on British Railways three times already in October, and they only changed the movies at the end of the oh. month. <laughs> and I knew exactly what was waiting oh. for me. And I don't know what's happened to British Airways, but their movie selection is not good anymore. <laughs> and actually, they were showing Logan, but uh, well, you really... You've seen it, I think. You can't be seen watching your own movie. <laughs> you know. yes. 
I do remember once, back in the business class days, uh, <laughs> flying, and to my horror, the screen movie, because remember, there used to be just one screen yeah. at the front of the movie. And it was Star Trek. It was oh. Star Trek. <laughs> oh. my hands like this, no, please. Um, but I, I will come to the yeah. point. That's right. Yeah, um, so you take your time. The last <laughs> thing my wife said to me before I left this evening was, don't talk too much. No. no. <laughs> Isn't that I, why I'm there? <laughs> All respect so to Sonny. You talk too much. Talk Let the much man you ask you questions. <laughs> He's been preparing all day for these questions. Look at them. That's just stack of notes. Um, no, I, I, I went that, 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 and so, oh, now here yeah. was interesting. And all of a sudden, up came Shawshank Redemption. Now, my son was in a stage production of Shawshank Redemption last year, which was quite successful and toured England. Um, I had never seen it. Wow. Oh, yes, indeed. They will take my knighthood away from me. <laughs> <laughs> if they knew. Um, and I thought, Damn it, I will watch it. I don't really like watching great movies. I was told it was a great movie on an airplane, but I will watch it. Um, I actually cried three times doing that. I mean, I mean sobbing. My wife is saying, what's wrong, what's wrong? Oh, you're watching a movie, of course you're crying again. <laughs> um, what a beautiful movie. Fantastic, yeah. Exquisite and perfect. The performances, the direction, the camera work, all of it. And so emotionally, Potent, I found. Get busy living or get busy dying, right? Yeah. That's what they say, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned growing up and watching the movies in Murfield, right? That's where you grew up in England. That's where I grew up. Yeah. It's a, a community of 11,000 people, yeah. and we had three cinemas. Yeah, wow, that's actually pretty good for you. Yeah, yeah fantastic. And there was a... The Vale, oh. the Town Hall, <laughs> and the Assaldo. Oh, what was the first, do you remember the first big movie that you mentioned, the Technicolor films? Was it like something like uh, Giant or something big? on the screen like that? Well, um, I used to have to go to matinees because I wasn't old enough to be let out in the evening. Right. Um, and how times have changed. You know, when it was a case of a, a rated movie that I couldn't get into because I was too young, um, I, not just me, but my pals did the same thing. We would go down the queue when people used to queue to get into movies and find a likely looking person and say, please, will you take me in? Oh, yeah. Accompanied by an adult. Yep. Can you imagine right. children being yeah. recommended mm -hmm. to do that today? <laughs> um, and then the moment you gave them the money and they bought your ticket, and the moment you were inside, you said goodbye and you left them and you sat yeah. where you wanted to sit. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I, as I said, I love Technicolor. Oh my, I love Technicolor. And so, Doris Day, Debbie Reynolds. Mm. Rock Hudson, Tab Hunter. I'm on, I wanted to marry Doris Day. I was so in love with her. And the voice, the singing voice and the acting, mm -hmm. that blonde hair. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the big transformation came when I was 13. And uh, on a Monday night, because that's what I spent my money on, on nothing else, just movies. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I went to the Asoldo cinema and um, see a movie I had not heard of. I mean, how could I hear of it? I didn't read reviews or anything like that. Uh, and I saw from the stills outside that it was in black and white. And, and I really didn't want to watch a black and white movie. It was a Monday night and I wanted to have color, you know. Um, and the movie was called On the Waterfront. And um, I saw it three times that week. I even took my poor mother to see it, who had no idea what was going on in the movie, and I kept trying to explain what was happening. Um, yeah, it, it changed my vision of the movies because, first of all, people acted like real people. Yeah. And with all great respect to Tab Hunter and Rock Hudson, it wasn't quite the way people worked in those days. There was a heightened style, even about film acting in those days. I didn't know the, the name of Elia Kazan. Um, I knew of Marlon Brando, of course, but that was about it. But the work of Marlon Brando and Rod Steiger and, um, uh, and 
Uh, well, I'm thinking just of on the waterfront. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, Eva Marie Saint um, was extraordinary. Um, Lee J. Cobb. Um, and I didn't know people made movies about people like me. Now, I wasn't brought up on the, the, the Brooklyn waterfront, although I actually now live within stone's throw of Red Hook, which <laughs> gives me great satisfaction every time I think of that. Um, but m m we were working class. We, were, we had no money, uh, just enough to pay the rent. and. My, my father was a kind of semi-skilled laborer. My mother worked in a weaving shed in a huge, massive, noisy, dusty, dirty weaving shed. For 40 years she worked there and she loved every moment of it. I once went to visit her and she was a tiny woman, my mum, and she was operating not one, but two of these huge machines, bigger than the stage that we're sitting on here. And um, so, I was aware of the, you know, the pay scales and unions and, and bosses who were bastards. And uh, so much of the subject matter of On the Waterfront, I understood, even though it was a different kind of existence yeah. from the one that I lived in. And I realized that you could make movies about real people. Mm -hmm. And um, from then on, I'm sorry to say that the Doris Day infatuation just gradually faded away. Yeah. And yeah, and Eva Marie Saint. I'll tell you a little story about Eva Marie Saint. Um, I was playing Winter's Tale at Stratford on Avon in the theater, the horrible, nasty bastard at King, Leontes. Um, Dame Peggy Ashcroft said to me, you don't want to play that part. Not an actor alive has ever enjoyed playing that role <laughs> because he's a really bad guy and the audience hate him right from the very beginning. They hate him. Um, and uh, uh, something had happened about that production. I was offered the role. I didn't want to do it because of what I'd been told. No, 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 no. It's a horrible role. Um, and the director asked to see me. And he said, I'd never worked with him before, but I liked him. And he was a very clever guy, a philosopher, uh, a man. He was, he, he, was, he was a professor of philosophy and a theater director. And he said to me, here's what you have to understand. This man already lives inside you. He's there. The best and the very worst of him is inside you. And all I'm going to ask you to do is let it out. And I give you my word, I remember him saying this so clearly, I will never leave your side. I will be there all the time. And nothing bad will happen to you. And I took him at his word and trusted him, and I went for it. And. Uh, a friend of mine, an American professor of Shakespeare at UCLA, saw it two or three times and liked it very much. And he said, you know, your production and your performance would have been more successful if the audience hadn't felt that they shouldn't be there watching, that it was actually too private and too personal, which was a kind of backhanded, fabulous compliment. Yes. <laughs> uh, that's how I took it anyway. And um, one, And so when the show was over, I was always drained, emotionally drained and everything. And I would usually sit in my underwear in, in, in the number one dressing room at the Royal Shakespeare mm -hmm. Theatre, and I would have a glass of whiskey. Mm -hmm. And the stage doorman knew that I would always be the last one out, and we had this agreement. I will, I, you know, I, I will, won't take it right up to the wire, because he had to do his rounds and lock everything up. But one night while I'm sitting there thinking about the evening, there was a knock at my door. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving. I'll, I'll be out in a few minutes. And a voice said, uh, Mr. Stewart, no, uh, no, we, we'd just like to say hello. Uh, female American voice. And I went and I pulled open the door and there was Eva Marie Saint. Wow. Oh. And her husband, her wonderful husband. And she said, we were halfway back to our hotel and we were talking about your show. And, and her husband said to her, you know what, maybe he's still in the theater. Let's go back and see if we can find him. And uh, so they came in and they shared my glass of whiskey with me. And uh, yeah. so can you imagine what it was like oh. for an actor who just played King Leontes in The Winter's Tale with the Royal Shakespeare Company to have Eva Marie Saint in my dressing room? <laughs> she cropped up once more in my life on the evening 
that I had signed my contract to do Star Trek The Next Generation, six seasons. As it turned out, it was seven. Um, I went to a dinner party, and she was there. And she said, so what's going on with you? It's a long time since I saw you. What's been happening? And I said, well, I've just signed on to do this, and I'm not sure if I've done the right thing. And she said, you have done absolutely the right thing. You, you have got a job that so many actors in this town would kill for. Yeah. So enjoy it as much yeah. as you can. And that was the last time that I ever oh. saw her. But I've got to tell you also, and I will shut up, I no, promise you, any more than that. No, do it's, not. It's, it's coming to an end. The, the same delightful hostess invited me some years later uh, to a dinner, and I was at Paramount, we were shooting, and so I was a little late arriving, and when I, when I got there, I was taking off my coat quickly in the hallway, and uh, as I was doing that, I'd seen in the dining room there were a dozen places set around a big dining table, and I saw there were name, you know, place, uh, you know, people's names. The seating was all arranged. And I looked into the living room where everyone was, and sitting on a sofa was Carl Malden, of course, who so memorably played the priest in On the Waterfront. And I grabbed hold of the hostess' arm and said, I know you've got place names, but please, please, <laughs> you must sit me next to Carl Malden. I, I will explain later, but, but right now. <laughs> You know, like, like you know, like I, like it was some yeah. gorgeous actress that well. I wanted to be sitting next to. Carl <laughs> Malden and dear sweet man, I must have wrecked his evening. You know, <laughs> with with questions like, so in that scene, uh, it, it's it's when all the the uh, the crates of whiskey have been dropped on a stevedore's head because he's a against the union. Mm -hmm. And you come in and you give this sermon, a sermon down on the hold and all around are the different layers of the ship, beautifully shot scene. And, and I said, finally, you finish your, your, your sermon about goodness and honesty and, 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 and the need for people to be respected. And he gets onto the hoist mm -hmm. and, as, and the hoist starts to go through, up, up through all the different layers of the ship. Yeah. And I said, there's a moment when you're halfway up and you reach into your pocket and you take out a packet of cigarettes yeah, right. and, and you put it in your mouth and the cigarette's kind of crumpled <laughs> and you light it. I say, was that in the script? Or, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about something that happened 40 years ago. <laughs> was, was that in the script? I mean, or, or you know, did the director suggest that you yeah. should do that? I mean, <laughs> And it was so unexpected, you're a priest, and we don't used to see priests yeah, smoking. Yeah. <laughs> Why, what happened? Poor, poor Mr. Malden had to <laughs> listen to this. And he said, mm, why did I smoke the cigarette? Oh, yes, he said, I really needed to smoke. <laughs> It was the perfect answer, <laughs> you know? You have an impulse and you respond That's to it. That's right. You can't always respond That's to right. the impulses, but living in the moment That's is what, right. what he was saying to yep. me. That's I'm right. shutting up. No, and, he's, <laughs> and, and like all great actors, that moment of, of sort of inspiration comes from something that's just from the gut, and he recalled it 40 years later, probably just like it was yesterday, which I love, yeah. Now, you mentioned a couple of things. One is that, uh, that On the Waterfront uh, felt familiar to you growing up in Murfield, and you also mentioned the, the director saying, I'll be by your side the whole time, which reminds me of something that you've said before, which is that since Cecil Dormand, who was such an important person in your life, gave you that copy of Merchant of Venice when you were 12, right? Mm -hmm. That you have always felt safest on stage, and I think that that's mm -hmm. such a beautiful sentiment, and would love to talk to you more about that. What, how, do you still feel like that? Do you still feel sort of safest on a stage, whether it's a movie set, a TV set, on stage, do you feel still that same level of safety? It's different on a movie set or a TV set. Um, the whole process yeah. is of uh, a, 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 a thrilling and exciting and challenging nature. But um, one of the reasons I love going back to the theater whenever I can is that you tell the whole story at one go. And uh, you know, there's a beginning and a middle and an end, and then it's done. And you're also playing it in front of a live audience. And I, I tell myself this at every single performance, somewhere out there, there is one person who is watching a live play for the first time and has never seen one before. It reminds me of a cartoon I saw in Punch, the, the kind of English version of, uh, of uh, the New, York, New Yorker, yeah. um, where uh, 
it, it's, it's like all of you, it's, it's a cartoon is looking at the front row in a theater. And um, uh, they're all, everybody in the front row is like this. <laughs> <laughs> Except for one person who is doing this. <laughs> and the, the caption was, um, Regular theater goers and one first timer. Oh. And that's the guy <laughs> that I, I, I think about. He's yeah. out there yeah. and he doesn't know what's going to happen next. And especially with Shakespeare, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they don't know yeah. that, that, that when Hamlet goes to King Kilt Claudius while he's on his knees praying that he won't actually do it. He will put the sword down. They think he's going to kill him. So it must be wonderful. And I think that's where a lot of us actors have to put ourselves into that position of this has never happened before. And it's how you create the, on a, a run of like, I just, well, last year Ian McKellen and I did the Pinterplay, No Man's Land in London, and we did eight shows a week for six months. Um, and yet every night has to be for the first time. Yeah. It has never happened before. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is part of the process that yeah. can bring you to that point where, um, yes, you cannot turn everything. Well, some actors can mm -hmm. yeah. upset the apple cart, um, literally. But you can um, be in that rare moment with a group of people who've never seen it before. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Star Trek when you were talking about Ava Marie Saint, and that brings up Shakespeare as well, because you've said that you felt out of your depth, Patrick, when you, when you, you know, were kind of just getting in there, but you also felt as if so much of your career had been building up to it and preparing for it, because there is that symbiotic link between Star Trek and Shakespeare both. Mm -hmm you know, in the text and in the subtext in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And that's, that was, that's, that's true, right? That there is, there, that you felt at the 1987, 30 years ago, exactly. Let's have a round of applause for that. <laughs> that, that you felt everything's been working up to this point, right? Yeah. Uh, the reason that this is known is because of something I said to a journalist. Um, when, when, when the, the new series of Next Generation was announced, by the way, the Los Angeles Times, uh, in announcing the cast, described me as unknown British Shakespearean actor. <laughs> and uh, uh, my dear friend Brent Spiner, who played Data the Android so magnificently, and if ever there was an injustice done, it was that that man never even got a damn nomination yep. for anything for totally. it. And his work was a Astounding. And uh, he had, uh, he had a, a, a poster made, and he stuck it on the door of my trailer. And it said in big letters, beware, unknown British Shakespearean actor. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, I, I got irritated. I hadn't done press like that yeah. before. You don't do press. Yeah. At least I didn't do it in those days. Now, if I do a play, then there's yeah. much more press. But um, I had become really irritated by the suggestion that a number of journalists were making that by turning away from the Royal Shakespeare Company and all the Shakespeare I've been doing and the West End of London and BBC and so forth, that, and coming into a first-run syndicated science fiction show that was a spin-off of an earlier show that had been on, that I was somehow slumming, that I had gone way, way down market. And I was offended about this. I was so thrilled and excited to be in this thing. And the kind of, you know, how does it feel, you know, to be, uh, you know, wearing a space suit and you know, <laughs> pretend you're flying through space and all of that? And I said, listen, finally, all those years of sitting in the thrones of England in all of those Shakespearean plays, all of the years of being a prince or a, a baron or, some, or, a, or a king were nothing but a preparation for sitting in the captain's chair of the Enterprise. That's a great line. <laughs> and, um, and, and 
the, the, the journalist printed that, which was very nice of me. Yeah. I, was, I was kind of having a go at him yeah. with that. You know, yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing, I didn't answer your question before that, which was about safety. Uh, as I've suggested, my childhood was chaotic and uh, a little unsafe. Um, and uh, chaos isn't good for children. And when I was first put into a play, you mentioned his name, Cecil Dorman. I spoke to him only a few weeks ago on his 94th birthday. Uh, the man without whom none of, none of this would have happened for me because his influence over me was enormous. He was the first man to put Shakespeare in my hand, first man to cast me in a play with adults um, because he was a director and an actor himself. And um, yeah, the moment that I walked on to the stage, which was the stage of my school hall, um, and in a darkened auditorium and bright lights on the stage, I never had any unease. I, I, I was nervous, yeah. but never fearful, yeah. never frightened. Mm -hmm. uh, and still that continues because I knew who I was. I knew what was going to happen to me, more or less. Um, I knew how it was all going to end up and it was safer than my life. Yeah. And so the security that gave me then over the, once I'd, actually this wasn't really a full understanding until I came to Los Angeles and found that there was a thing called therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and years and years of very expensive LA therapy uh, <laughs> gave me the insight to see that it was that feeling of safety that I had, that nothing bad could happen to me, that I think gave me the, sometimes the courage to do things that otherwise I might not have done. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's all there in the text, it's all there on the stage, and so it's a, there's a comfort level to that, and that, that safety is yeah. there, yeah. Problems begin when you leave the stage yeah. door and go yeah. back into the yeah. outside world. Yeah. Was there anything about Picard, you've, you've mentioned others have as well and as part of that amazing cast, that at a certain point obviously the characters and the actors sort of merged on that next generation and, and there was that fluidity. Um, but I'm wondering if there was something about Picard that you knew that you never told anybody else, that you haven't mentioned to audiences, that you just sort of kept to yourself. You're thinking he did, it's something that happened to him here. There was this little aspect of his personality that you just had in the back of your head for that character. You don't even have to share it with us now if you, if you don't want, but if there was something like that that you had in preparation. The marvelous thing about Star Trek was that it put the eight of us, the principal characters on the ship, into such diverse situations. Yeah. Um, and we had, which, um, uh, which Bill, Shatner and Leonard never had. We had the, um, what was it called? The place where we could become other people. Oh, the holodeck. Holodeck, thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had the holodeck, so we could, I mean, I became yeah. a, 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 a cinema noir yeah. detective yeah. at yeah. one point. I was a Shakespearean character yeah. at another point. Um, and, and we could live out these other existences. And often I used to suggest to the writers and producers that, that we should look at maybe the fantasy world of Jean-Luc Picard a little bit and see what those fantasies might actually be. The detective idea was not mine, it was one of the senior writer's idea, but it, it, it helped to release the inner life of, of so many of those characters. But I can't say that I can come up with a direct answer to your question. Yeah. Let me, we'll kind of merge those and say one of my favorite episodes of the series is Tapestry, in which Captain Picard uh, realizes that something he had looked at previously as sort of a negative in his life turns out to be the thing that set him on his path as a leader. I'm wondering if there was something like that in your own life, maybe that you looked at at the time and said, yeah, I shouldn't have done that, that was a wrong turn. And later in life you said, you know what, had it not been for that moment or that performance or that, that uh, left turn I took, I wouldn't have gotten to the right place. Anything like that? Well, there have been several of those. Uh, uh, I, I, I had no real education. Um, I, I went to school, but it was not an academic school. It was, it, was, it was the kind of school you sent failures to. Uh, you failed your exams, you went to the school I went to. Um, you didn't go to grammar school. So it was very, very non-academic. Um, and 
uh, and I was a, a very, I had to be because of my childhood, I was a very grown up child. I was adult before my time, so I was never a teenager at all. I am now. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, yep. I know what it's like now to be a teenager. <laughs> um, and um, the, the, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten where I was going to go with this okay. one. Uh, I was talking about being a teenager. And, and, and sort of the notion that you never got a chance to sort of be a kid and... Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, it's gone. Oh, it's okay. Move on. <laughs> well, let me just, I'll, I'll help you and bridge a little bit and just sort of say that one of the things I've often loved, though, in reading about you is that there, there is an aspect of, um, of, let's say, teaching that, that has kind of gone through. You were discovered, as it were, uh, for Star Trek by uh, a TV producer hearing you teaching, hearing you visiting a class. You were a chancellor at the University of Huddersfield in England for 10 years, um, and you go back to Mersfield a lot. In fact, your phenomenal, and so, I'm just thinking about it now, still fills my heart with, with emotion. One-man performance of A Christmas Carol was first given in Mersfield in, uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> was first given in Murfield in, in 1984 as a kind of when you first tried it out in, in, as a three hour production of it before it got to Broadway in, yeah. in 91, right? Let's talk about that. How did, how did that come about and, and the, the one man, phenomenal one man show, 30 characters of A Christmas Carol that got you a Drama Desk Award in 91? Yeah. Hold on to that question because okay. I remembered what I was saying. Okay. About. Um, <clears throat> um, when I left this non-academic school, I was head boy of my school at 14. Wow. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I, and I was at meetings with the headmaster. And the, the, I was just this kind of serious mm -hmm. adult mm -hmm. um, who ought to be in an, uh, having fun. Yeah. Um, and uh, strings were pulled. And they seemed to think that I had something else going for me. And I got a job on my local newspaper. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, a cub reporter mm -hmm. for just about a year when finally I was given an ultimatum by the editor of the paper over his desk in his office, which was, um, make up your mind what you want to be. Do you want to be a newspaper reporter? Do you want to be a journalist? Or do you want to continue with this stupid acting that you <laughs> seem to be so obsessed with? Because I was, you know, I would, I would be sent on jobs and I wouldn't go to them because I had a rehearsal. Um, I would have complicated networks of people who would phone copy into me. Um, uh, or other people who would go there and yeah. write it and I would pay them right. to do this <laughs> because, because I had to be at a rehearsal. Yeah. And uh, on one or two occasions, I made stuff up. You could get a job now at Fox. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, maybe or any not network, Fox. or any mm, any network, really. Yeah. Yes, nowadays. Uh, and uh, he was very upset about this, yeah. and I was found out. I remember handing in my copy to the sub editor, and him saying, "Patrick." And whenever I heard that tone of voice, I knew I was in trouble. And and he said, "What is this? Did this really happen?" Well, mm, not really, Joe. In the way that you know it happens here, but he said you made it up, didn't you? Well. Yeah, I made it up. And, and uh, that's a horrible thing to do. You can't be a journalist and invent copy. So um, he said, it's up to you. What are you going to do? And uh, I said, goodbye. And I went upstairs, packed up my old typewriter, and left the job. And my friend who worked on the paper with me said, you're crazy. You're crazy. I mean, you were so lucky to get this job. You've had no education. What are you going to do? Well, I went to work in a furniture store. I sold furniture for 16 months. Um, and I was very, very good furniture uh, yeah. salesman. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, uh, and um, the, the opportunity to be a professional actor was given me by Cecil Dormant and by a wonderful man called Gerald Tyler and my teacher. I had a teacher for five years, Ruth, Ruth Winnow, long, long gone. And um, they, I look back and I, I I honestly don't know why. I thought a lot about this, and, and in fact, I've actually I've I've talked to Cecil Dormand about it. Um, uh, why this happened? Mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious to know how did it come about that a, a young boy from a rough background, with no education, with everything laid out for his life to be 
miserable mess should have evolved in this way because I didn't really, I didn't really understand it. Cecil Dormand has always refused to give his opinion on why that came about. Um, he was very charming. He was invited to my luncheon party when I went to the palace and got my knighthood. A dear friend said, we'll have a luncheon. You invite whoever you like. And I invited my headmaster to come to this luncheon because I thought it would, it would make both of us very happy. And uh, then they asked, they went around the table saying, each one of you say one thing that you think people don't know about Patrick Stewart. And of course, nobody knew who Cecil Dormant was. And when he came to him, he said, well, the fact is that uh, my life and Patrick's life has changed because for five years he called me sir. <laughs> <laughs> and now the tables are turned. <laughs> it put all that into a certain perspective. Yeah. yeah. Have you always been, I would imagine that being in a furniture store and being uh, just sort of out in the world like that, are you an observer? Do you watch people? Do you sort of file them away both uh, their traits and maybe people you know? We all do, don't yeah. we? I mean, it's, it's one of the great delights of yeah. doing what we do, or I would imagine also being a writer. Um, no experience is wasted, none. You know, you, you all know what sense memory is, and sense memory plays a huge part in, in what I do. And quite, I have arthritis, and the other day I had to have injections in my knuckles. And uh, if you've never had injections into where bone, there's a lot of bone, it's uncomfortable. And I had to have eight done, four in each hand. And after the third one, all I could think was, I'm not going to get through this. I, I know now what's coming. And, and I, I don't think I can tolerate it. And then the sense memory kicked in and said, Patrick, you're an actor. This is important. Remember what you're feeling. Remember what you're experiencing. Remember what that pain does to you. Remember the fear that you're feeling when you see the needle come back up again to do another finger. Um, and and, and the, so much of the pain was just dissipated because it was work. Yeah. I was practicing, and then that gets filed away in the sense memory bank, and a moment will come at some point when I have to be fearful or in agony or something, and I will drag that one out. And it's, um, that's why I think, as a profession, on the whole, very few actors have breakdowns, actually. Very, 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 very few. Mm -hmm. You look at some other professions, and it's endemic. Right emotional breakdowns. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's because that what we do is a, a glorious form of therapy in itself, mm -hmm. that we are continually having to put ourselves into someone else's shoes, look at the world through someone else's eyes. And I, I firmly believe that if in this world, particularly in the world of politics, if people could do that more, Let's just change places for a moment and see what the situation looks like now. Yeah. Very, very different. Yeah. And that's what we do all the time. We're continually seeing the world through new eyes. And I think, I think it helps to keep us relatively rooted. Yeah. You bring up uh, pain and fear and agony, and that brings us, of course, to Logan. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because this phenomenal film and this phenomenal performance is so special and it's so interesting because we were talking before we came on stage, one of the things it does, and we'll get back to your first performances, Charles Xavier in a, in a moment, but it reverses everything we know about Charles Xavier. This is a, a character who's always been powerful, always been in control, and we come to him in Logan um, with the tables turned. And what was it like approaching this character for the seventh time with that situation? It was a dream situation, I think, for, for any actor it would be. I had spent 15 years as Charles Xavier in, I think, six movies and, and you know, little yeah. appearances, cameos in, in the Wolverine movies. Um, and I liked Charles Xavier. He was a sensitive, highly intelligent, borderline intellectual with great compassion and affection, in, indeed love for, for those, those young people that he had found and brought into the yeah. Charles Xavier yeah. School for Gifted Children, um, uh, or for learning disorders, as I think I improvised in the movie. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then, 
um, along comes a script where all of that is gone. Instead, there is instability, uh, discomfort, confusion, uh, uh, unhappiness, anger, fury, um, uh, and even a, an abrupt change in his language as well. I mean, I heard the gasp the first time an audience heard some of the things that came out of my mouth. You heard one just <laughs> yeah. now in this clip. And, um, and, and most of all, very, very dangerous. Yeah. Um, a man who has about him an uncontrollable um, impulse that can destroy people's lives. Uh, and it's uh, brutal and savage. So without ever letting go of or losing sight of who the original Charles Xavier had been, the fun, and the fun it was, was to put him down and say, what, what if? What if this had happened to Charles? What if, if he couldn't think properly, he couldn't think clearly, his language was transformed? What if he was a terror? To, uh, to other individuals, um, what would happen? And, and we were blessed, Hugh and, and Daphne Keene and myself, that we had um, James Mangold because James had a vision for Logan um, that was not a conventional superhero, uh, science fiction, fantasy film vision at all. And he wanted to make this movie very, very much. First of all, he got Hugh on his side, and Hugh became an absolute champion for the style of the movie and, and who Logan had become as well, because he's transformed too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a guy driving a crappy old limo in order to keep Charles alive. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he's doing it. Yeah. Um, and the studio, I got to mention them because they were, fantastic, 20th Century Fox, um, got behind this approach when really they would have had every reason to say, no, 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 just give us another X-Men movie. That's what we want. And James wouldn't. Yeah. And, and once I was on part of the project too, I joined both of them. And, and we were continually looking for those elements that would at times detach us as much as possible from what had gone before, so that people feel that they're watching something quite new and quite, quite different. Um, we had such a great time. I loved working with, with Mangold. Um, the, uh, I, soccer is a great passion of mine. Um, this hand was actually in the hand of Lionel Messi on Monday night. <laughs> Not because I particularly wanted to meet him, but my wife did. <laughs> Lionel Messi converted her to soccer. She had no interest in it at all until she saw how this man played ball. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew he was going to be at this event. I'd accepted an invitation to present an award because I'm, I'm also pr uh, president of the academy of a premiership football team in mm -hmm. England, mm -hmm. a team I've supported since I was seven. And, um, I knew there would be a lot of great, because it was an international event. It wasn't just yeah. the, the British Football League. And I didn't know that, that Messi would be there, but I hoped that he would. And I told my wife, if he's there, I will do everything in my power <laughs> to bring the two of you face to face. <laughs> and, and she said, what if he becomes my celebrity pass? I said, that's fine by me. <laughs> absolutely fine. <laughs> and, uh, it was really, really hard because there was security like you've never seen. Oh, yeah. You know, it yeah. might have been the royal family in attendance because uh, there was Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo and, and, and there was um, the, the other great uh, Argentinian, um, uh, ah, an old guy now. Maradona. Maradona, thank you. Diego Maradona, la mano de Dios. <laughs> he actually handed a ball into the net of the British goal in a, in a match once. And, uh, and I, you, couldn't get, you couldn't get to them. I was sitting on the front row, but right at one end of the cinema, and, and all these guys were at the other end of the cinema. And um, 
I decided when the show is over, I'm going to make a run for it. And they were saying, thank you, everybody. What a great night. Thank you. Wonderful. Come again next year. Blah, 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 blah. And I turned to my wife and said, you follow me and stay close. <laughs> and I shot along the front of the theater between, between the edge of the stage and the front row. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And I know people are thinking, oh, my God, there's some crisis. Some, something has gone wrong. And then I hit the security wall. Excuse me, excuse me, I was saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's Patrick Stewart. I was saying, I'm sorry, I am so embarrassed myself. I was saying, it's, I'm Patrick Stewart, I'm Patrick Stewart, thinking <laughs> it might have some impact. <laughs> and I arrived, at the, and, and they were going, oh, uh, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> and I saw, I saw Cristiano Ronaldo look up and go, oh, who's this guy? <laughs> and um, I, couldn't see, I couldn't see Leo. He wasn't... Uh, he, wasn't, he had actually turned around and bent down over his seat. And he's quite short. And so he just vanished yeah. behind everybody. <laughs> and I stood behind him, and then he stood up and turned around, and we were face to face. Wow. And his face, oh, you see, this is very emotional for me. He just beamed into uh. my face. <laughs> and, I, and I said, Senor Messi, por favor, yeah. mi esposa. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they shook hands, and, um, and, 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 then his, and then I said, can I please take a photograph of the two of you together? Uh, yeah. So I took, the not a selfie, I took a photograph of Lionel Messi and my wife side by side. And then his wife said, and I want a photograph with you. <laughs> well, that was only four nights ago. <laughs> And as you can see, I'm still a little stimulated yeah. by it. <laughs> well, Back over to you, John. Yeah. Well, his, and his, well, his response at seeing you, I mean, that's always been our response to seeing you on screen, and which is one of the reasons why Logan is such, you've lo you lost 20 pounds for, for Logan, right? And mm -hmm. there are moments when Hugh picks you right up off the, off the ground. That was one of the reasons. Yeah, so that, yeah. But I mean, and you lose it, you look, I mean, Charles is, is uh, it's a different Charles that we see. Yeah, you know? it, and I'm very lucky that when I, when I work at losing weight, which I can do, I'm happy to say, relatively easily, um, I lose it here. And so, you know, within seven or eight pounds, I'm looking emaciated. Yeah. And uh, that was really great for, for mm -hmm. Charles in the movie because uh, I, I wanted, you know, this guy we've seen sitting in this wheelchair, upright, strong, determined, yeah. clear skin, clear eyes. I wanted it to be as big a shock as, yeah. as possible. Yeah. And, uh, and, and luckily, uh, James Mangold was thoroughly in favor of that approach. Well, the film is, it's fun. It's one of my favorite films of the year. And it's a, it's a, it becomes a parable about parenthood and about uh, looking forward and looking back and looking at the future and, and all of those things. We're going to take some questions from the audience in just a moment. But, um, you know, with the, with the notes that we have from everybody, but your, your story uh, about sports reminds me of just, is there anything that you enjoy doing that fulfill, that, that kind of feeds your acting, your, your, your processes, but isn't necessarily related to acting. It could be sports, it could be woodworking, it could be painting, anything like that, or music, but things that ultimately when you're done, you say, I have, I've refilled the coffers a little bit, I feel you know, re-energized a little bit, and ready to go again. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, um, I've taken up painting. Oh, yeah. Uh, again, at my, my wife's insistence. And uh, I, 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 I have a, I'm a collector, and, mm -hmm. and so art plays a very, very important part in my life. I talk to these damn paintings. I, I will have been away for quite a while, and when I go home, I go from room to room, and I say, hi, sorry, I've missed you. How are you doing? <laughs> I mean, people have overheard me saying this. They said, who are you talking to? <laughs> oh, nobody. <laughs> nobody. Um, but they're a big part of my life, and she said, I think there's something that you, that you could do with a, a pot of paints and uh, give it a shot. And that's what's happened. Mm -hmm. Hours pass. Mm -hmm. And I don't eat, I don't drink, mm -hmm. except, of course, this yeah. good stuff. And, and um, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I, have, uh, I have completely untaught. I'm going to have lessons mm -hmm. after Christmas. And uh, that means a great deal to me. I play a lot of table tennis. I was playing mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. My neighbor and I, we have a table in the garage mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. And uh, we play extremely intense and passionate uh -huh. games of, <laughs> of table tennis. And thanks to my in-laws, um, who are from Nevada, mm -hmm. uh, 
wonderful people. At my, our wedding, uh, when it was my turn to make a speech, I started out by saying, listen, I just want to say that the rumor circulating that I have married Sonny so as to be near her parents <laughs> is entirely true. <laughs> um, because they're so fabulous. And uh, they ski, they're all incredible skiers, uh -huh. but also crazy too. Uh, <laughs> somebody who, who, who's in their locker room took me aside one day and said, you, you, you ski with the Michelsons? And I said, yeah, and he said, <laughs> don't do what they do. They're, they're crazy, you know. Don't do what they do. And they didn't wear helmets or anything like that. They were just free skates. And um, I went up to stay with them at their cabin in, near Tahoe. And uh, um, over dinner, they said, oh, and by the way, uh, we're, we're leaving at about 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. We like to be on the slopes good and early. And, uh, and your lessons begin at 8 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> what lessons is this? Uh, skiing lessons. You don't ski, do you? And I said, no, I don't ski, and I am not going to start now. <laughs> I was 74, thereabouts, yeah. and uh, I said, no, it's too late. Yeah. It's too late. <laughs> but they said, don't you? I said, yes, all my life I wanted to ski. I sit and I watch winter sports on television endlessly. What must it feel like? Yeah. What must it feel like? And they said, well, there you are. You, you, and I said, God, what am I going to do? So they booked me four hours for four mornings, one-on-one -on -one with a wonderful middle-aged Austrian instructor. And on the fourth morning at 12 noon, she said, OK, that's it. You're, you're done. Enjoy. Have fun. And I got on the biggest lift, and I went up to the top of the mountain. It was, thank the Lord, it was a quiet day, uh, as it often is there. And I skied down the mountain from top to bottom. I didn't fall. I, I went very slowly at times, mind you. Yeah. But there was a moment coming down the mountain. And again, this is sense memory stuff. Yeah. This is why nothing is wasted. And I, I was getting more and more confident, and, and the feeling was good. And, and then I heard this noise. And I knew what that was, because I'd seen it and heard it on television. But I realized, I'm making that noise. Oh. It's coming from my skis. <laughs> and um, I absolutely love it. I will never get any better than I am now. I've reached the kind of point where to go any further would be yeah. insane. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I do, I do sort of. Scary stuff occasionally. Well, it scares me. Yeah. Well, you don't want to be the you don't want to be the guy like in Wide World of Sports that goes down at the beginning. You don't want to be that guy. You want to be nice and smooth. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And the conditions up there are just beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so these things have come into my life, um, including my wife. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I said to you earlier, I'm learning what fun it can be to be a teenager. Yeah, that's part of it. Yeah, I love that. We're going to take some questions now from our great audience. A question from Mark. He asks, what advice slash tips would you give to actors or directors of Shakespeare? Well, I, I would actually propose to them that they might try using the same principles that my teacher taught me back, uh, you know, all those years ago. Um, that kind of reading of a play, how to read a play, and determine what it means to you, mm -hmm. and how you can bring that into a communicative role so that other people can see what it means to you. Yeah. Um, but for actors and directors, it's kind of different, isn't it? Uh, I, uh, first of all, if you're American, please don't do it in an English accent. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> when I did The Tempest here uh, uh, at the Delacorte a long time ago, and, yeah. oh, um, I made the decision very early on. I said to the director, you must not allow a single member of this cast to use a fake English accent. And furthermore, I will do everything in my power to be as American as I possibly can. And it was a transformation and a liberation for me to be saying those great speeches of Prospero, but with a different sound coming out of my mouth was, was such a treat. Um, so yeah, stick to uh, what is comfortable and familiar. And... Um, Trust the language, because it will do so. I, 
Ian McKellen is a dear friend, as some of you may be aware from our antics. Um, uh, he is, because uh, it's bedtime now in, in England, he is two performances away from his last performance tomorrow night in King Lear. Oh, he's playing wow. King Lear. And uh, he said to me, because he's played it before, this is different, you know. I'm, uh, I've never before, and this wasn't a prompting by me, he said, I've never before just trusted the words the way that I am doing now, that the words are so perfect that all you need to do is release them, set them free, just let them go, and they will do so much of the work with you. Now, I've not been able to see his performance, and unless it goes somewhere else, I won't see it. But um, he has great insight into things. When, when I was about to start rehearsing Macbeth, and he is one of the great Macbeths of, of my generation, he and, and Dame Judy did it brilliantly with the RSC. Uh, we met somewhere, and uh, I said, oh, man, I'm starting on Macbeth. Give me just one thought, will you? Just one thing that, that was important to you when you did it. Can you share that with me? And he said, yes. Um, so you got that line. Uh, it's quite famous, quite well known. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And I said, yeah, but, but, but yeah, I know what that means. He said, I think perhaps you don't. Because what I'd like you to think about and to try is the important word in that line of verse is not tomorrow, it's and. <laughs> and I instantly, I knew yeah. what he was telling yeah. me. Yeah. I absolutely knew what he was telling me. That it's not just listing, there well, there's tomorrow, and then there's the next day, and then the next day. Yeah. But there's next day, and then next day. And um, everything that I did was built around that wonderful note that, that McKellen gave me. Um, and I would not, I don't think I could have thought of it. I could not have thought of tomorrow and tomorrow, and tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and people would come back and say, that moment when you did that, that was, uh, and I said, well, uh, you must thank Siri and McKellen for that. <laughs> he gave me the note. You guys became great friends on X-Men, but you first saw him, you first watched him backstage even before you didn't even really speak to him, right? That was decades earlier, right? Far yeah. too intimidated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was, Ian leapt into the world, a great actor, I think. Uh, he was being reviewed by major London theatre critics when he was still a student at Cambridge. The word had already gone round, there's something happening <laughs> up there. You should go and have a look. And it was Ian McKellen. Yeah. And of course, he was in the same, he was at uh, Cambridge, the same time as Derek Jacobi, mm -hmm. and the same time as uh, Terry Hardiman, an art of Royal Shakespeare Company actor. There was a little kind of Cambridge mafia in the company. <laughs> and of course, Peter Hall and John Barton, That's right. great, yeah. great directors, yeah. uh, uh, were also Cambridge, mm -hmm. Cambridge graduates. Um, so he was, he's clever as well, he's smart, and he'd had an education, and that's the last thing that I had. And uh, he was also gorgeous. Oh, you see photographs of the young Ian McKellen. <laughs> Dreamy he is. Um, and I wasn't, you know, I looked like this. And, um, <laughs> So I was intimidated by that, and he always had a circle of friends around him who obviously adored him, and I was intimidated by that. So I just never spoke to him. Yeah. And finally, we were cast together in a play. Mm -hmm. uh, brilliant Tom Stoppard play called Every Good Boy Deserves Favor. Not very well known, largely because it needs a symphony orchestra to be performed, and that don't come cheap. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, we had a couple of scenes in that, and I felt a little more comfortable in his company. It was X-Men that brought us together. We had adjoining luxury trailers. Thank you very much, 20th Century Fox. And um, with movies like that, as so many of you will know, you spend a lot more time waiting to act than actually acting. Yeah. Um, who was it? I've always tried to find out. Somebody told me once it was Burt Reynolds who said, they pay me for waiting, I do the acting for nothing. <laughs> uh, it was certainly an American actor who said this, and boy, wow, is that true. Um, 
And so we would hang out in one another's trailers and drink tea and drink coffee, and later in the day it might be something else. And, uh, <laughs> and we found we had so much in common. And a lot of it was just an absolute passion for Shakespeare and the Royal Shakespeare Company, and movies too, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and acting, just the business of acting. So we've... Um, We've done a lot together in the last few years. Yeah, I saw you in Godot. It's amazing. And it's also one of the great public friendships, I feel like. We, you know, the pictures that you guys did uh, putting on Twitter is just, for the world to enjoy, was just so wonderful. We're going to take another question Not here. Not my idea. I always no? have to give credit for this. No. It was my wife's idea. Oh, really? Uh, in uh, Restaurant Fonda in, uh, in Park Slope, uh, she said, I've had a thought. I want you to think about this as a way of promoting Waiting for Godot. And she came up with the idea of go, go, and D, D, do, N, do NYC. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're sitting there, you know, uh, uh, with our meal. We, we just made a list of yeah. what are all the iconic sure. sites in New York. Uh -huh. And we'll go to all of them. And, and I, I think it was, it might have been Ian's idea. Why don't we wear the bowler hats? Yeah. We'll be tourists, <laughs> but we'll be tourists wearing bowler yeah. hats. And I am told that what the success of that approach has radically altered a lot of the way PR companies are approaching oh. publicizing, I mean, using yeah, social sure. media in, yeah. in that way to let yeah. people know what's going on and yeah. to give them an insight into something to do yeah. with the play. Yeah. We, we had so much fun. No, no, it was, it was terrific to watch, too. Just every, just every picture became another, another little story in and of that's itself. That's right. Billy asks that you, or says, you have one of the great speaking voices of all time, which we've been enjoying tonight. That's absolutely right. What speakers, actors, I'm assuming, uh, have you been inspired by? Oh, well, for a long time, British actors were known for their voices, mm -hmm. and they cultivated their voices. Um, there were no microphones. And yeah. I, it's, it kind of saddens me now that, I, I know it happened a long time ago that every theater in Broadway is mic'd, mm -hmm. and it's happened now in the West End of London. Mm -hmm. um, my son is playing in one of the, acting right now in one of the smallest, beautiful little theaters in the West End, and they're mic'd. Oh. And they, they say, well, audiences now expect to hear sound of a different quality, but they're not really hearing the human voice. And it feels, when I know I'm being mic'd, well, not now, of course, but uh, you, you feel that you don't have the control over what the audience hear in the way that you want to have it. Um, what was the question? Oh, was it, was it, what speakers have inspired you or oh, yeah. actors with you know, um, left Lewis voices? Well, at the beginning, of course, it, it would have been John Gilgood and Laurence Olivier and Alec Guinness. And then after that, the next one that came along was the great Paul Schofield. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Not widely known in the United States, yeah, maybe for yeah. one movie. Yeah. Uh, for, um, Man uh, for All Seasons. Man for All Seasons, thank you. Yeah. Or Quiz Show, he was great in Quiz Show too. I mean, he's, he's oh yes, he was great yes, yeah, in Quiz Show. Yeah. Um, but he had an extraordinary voice. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know what happened. People used to make fun of my voice once upon a time. Yeah. I mean, yeah, other actors in the, in, I shared a, Addressing them with five other actors at the Royal Shakespeare Company, we were way down the pecking order, and and they used to love saying my lines in my voice, allegedly my voice, <laughs> and it was kind of a little discouraging and being made fun of yeah. in that way. But well, you know, oh. I'm laughing on the other side of my face. That's right. <laughs> so I, I don't know, but. And this is what Hugh and I worked on in, 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 in Logan. Um, the, the, the tonality, the level of, of which we communicated with mm -hmm. one another. Yeah. More intimate than yeah. it had ever been before. Yeah. Um, more vulnerable, more, more of, of the, the, the inner truth of the character yeah. being present vocally. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of kind of humor and vocals, I mean, that sort of is a perfect lead into uh, Seth MacFarlane and your work with him and the, the vocal work that you've done so much over the last 20 years. 
something I read that I that I found interesting is that you really love to imitate the Shakespearean actors on the radio when you were a kid. After Cecil had given you that play, you listened to them on the radio and you kind of imitated them. I think that's a terrific line to go from there to poop in the emoji, <laughs> <movie>. or <laughs> you know anything, any of the other great perform American Dad, yeah. anything you know that you do, um, and and what joy you kind of get from that because that is such a pleasure for all of us to enjoy. Yeah, it, it is for me too. I, I've got to thank Seth MacFarlane because he is the one who's had the biggest impact. In in um, in allowing people to see that there is another actor inside Patrick Stewart, I always wanted to do comedy, and I was never cast in comedy roles. Oh. Even when I played Touchstone in As You Like It, the director had an idea that he was a very sad old man, <laughs> um, and so they cast me. And. Um, uh, it, so Seth played a big part casting me in American Dad, and I also have a little recurring role in, uh, in Family Guy too. I play Susie the mm -hmm. Baby, mm -hmm. yep. um, I know. <laughs> who is uh, who is too young to speak, but she thinks in my voice. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, it's brilliant! <laughs> and then uh, and then the next guy to come along was uh, Ricky Gervais. Yeah. Um, Ricky takes a lot of responsibility for this as well because I was in the market in my in Bermondsey in London one afternoon picking up some stuff and my phone rang and I said yeah hello and uh, this voice said uh, Patrick it's uh, it's Ricky it's uh, it's Ricky Gervais and I said oh for heaven's sake John will you stop doing because I have a friend who's a brilliant and he will call you up and use your voice <laughs> And he said, no, 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 Patrick, it, 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 it is Ricky, and I, I'm doing a new series, and uh, I just wondered if you'd be interested. He called me up in the market on my phone to ask me <laughs> if I was going to do this. Um, and um, I'd seen um, The Office yeah. and thought it was genius, it genius, particularly what he did with that extraordinary, obnoxious character. And I said, yep. And he said, we haven't got an idea yet. We don't know what it will be. So if you'll just be patient and let us work something out, you know, we'll get some ideas to you in a couple of days. And of course, what they came up with was this, this delightful Patrick Stewart that nobody had ever seen before. That's right, in extras, that's with right. With an obsession in watching women's clothes fall off. That's right. <laughs> we have a question from, <laughs> from uh, it looks like Gable, but I'm gonna say it's Gabby. If it's Gable, if it's Clark Gable, Please let us know. Uh, but I think it's it's Gabby, and it says audition advice for any for an upcoming actor. Something that would really help in making the best out of those five minutes in a room. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> um, the first, the first absolutely vital thing that you have to remember when you're going into an audition, whoever you are, however, whatever age you are, is, and I speak as somebody who has auditioned actors, because I've directed, I directed six episodes of Next Generation um, and done little bits of theater work. You must remember that all the people sitting behind that table want you to be the best thing that's ever walked through that door. They want you to be great. You've, they're already on your side. They want to be blown away by what you do. So. Cast aside the timidity, the unease, the fear, the insecurity, all those things that can wipe you out in an audition situation. You will never have as great an audience as you have in an audition because they want you to be brilliant. Um, and the next thing is, which is linked to that, is you must be fearless. Um, take risks. Be dangerous if you have to be because when actors dig into that boldness and bravery, which we all possess and we can all let loose in different ways, then interesting, unusual, fascinating, even things can happen. And that's when someone will say, that's who we want. I love what a terrific tip. They, they want you to be great. That's true. Yes. yes. And it wasn't until I was sitting behind the table that I realized that. And it's so simple. Yeah. Please let the next person come into the room. Be the one that I want. That's great. Wow. Cheryl asks, I'm about to embark upon my first Lady Macbeth in Verdi's opera and would appreciate oh. any insight you can provide on how to approach the dynamics of the couple's effect on one another. How fantastic. How amazing. It's you. Oh, oh, congratulations. 
Oh, how wonderful. Now, I've only ever seen the opera once, and it was a long, long, long time ago. Um, it's my opinion that if you're playing Macbeth, you have to hand the first act of Macbeth over to the lady because it's her show. She is running everything in that first half. This guy, <clears throat> he's, he's perfectly content with where he is. He's just won a famous battle. The king thinks he's brilliant. He's been promoted. He's been given another title. Everything is going so well for him, but not well enough for her. She wants more. And that's what drives the relationship and the play. Also, it was my own personal opinion that it, when I did it, that Macbeth is crazily in love with her, absolutely head over heels besotted with her. So um, if you'd like to send your Macbeth around to me, I'll have a word with him. And, <laughs> he's, uh, he's a very lucky man. <laughs> um, and, and, um, therefore, her ambition, which he increasingly taps into, and what he does initially, he's doing it for her. He's doing it because she wants it. What does she say? When you durst do it, then you were a man. He wants to be a man for her. And I deliberately, when I did it with the wonderful English director, Rupert Gould, um, I said to him, there's only one thing I, I, I need from you. I need you to cast the youngest Lady Macbeth you can find. I want her to be generations away from me. She's at the beginning of her life and her career. This is not a tired old relationship. I, I said, if you want to use that nasty phrase, she is really a trophy bride. He's got this fabulous, beautiful woman who is his partner for life. And... Um, and that might in some way help to give a special tension that people would understand within that relationship. Um, and uh, he is driven by her and is a reluctant um, monster. But the experience of casting himself in a, as a different kind of person begins to feel better and better and better, and it takes over. And as it, it's a wonderfully constructed play. As this spinning wheel begins to take over Macbeth and begins to run faster and louder and more and more dangerous in her, it begins to diminish. Um, why that diminution happens is your decision to make entirely. But I, to me, that's the structure. She is here. And the first time we see her, she is totally on top of her game. And it gradually unravels until we, we see her um, in the shocking state that she is in, in Act Four. Oh, how one, where are you going to do it? In January. Where? Oh. Actually, it's going to be um, at Most Precious Blood Church, which is in Little Italy. Uh huh. And will it be um, uh, a, a concert performance or a? Ah, uh, well, that's great. Yeah. How I'm wonderful! I'm looking forward. It's your first. Yes. Will you come? <laughs> I, I will come. And when is it? January. Uh, it's January twelfth, I believe. Yeah. And what will the weather be like? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm sure it will be beautiful. Well, I, I, I think I'm not in the United States after the new year, but have fun. You. Yeah. And be brave. Up. Be brave. That's the important thing. Yes. There's nothing to fear. Thank you so much. I know, but yes. yes. 
I don't know about you guys. I could sit here about the next six hours and less, listen to Patrick talk about the dynamics between all these Shakespeare characters. It's phenomenal. Um, but we're going to go with one last question coming from Dan. And he says, with all that you've done in your career, Patrick, there's something you're still yearning to do. It can be a play or movie, TV, or maybe something unrelated to the entertainment industry, hike Mount Everest, run for parliament, anything like that. Is there anything you're yearning to do? <clears throat> um, I, I have a feeling that somewhere out there, it may not exist yet, there is a movie script mm -hmm. that might one day land up on my, well, they don't land on your doorstep anymore, do they? They come <laughs> they're, 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 they're. Um, I have a policy about that. I hate reading off a screen. If I think it's going to be a script that won't interest me, I will read it off the screen. Yeah. If I think it's looking really good, I immediately go to my printer and I print it up and I have pages in my hand because then it feels somehow more real. I can believe in it then. Um, yeah, that great. I mean, I've had some wonderful roles. Wonder, I can't bitch and complain about what's <laughs> happened to me. But, you know, I mean, watching Morgan uh, on the plane yeah. three days ago in, in, in Shawshank Redemption, um, what an outstanding performance of so much complexity and richness and humor and sadness and at the, particularly at the end of the movie, uh, and when he walks along that beach mm -hmm. at the end of the movie, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Um, so I, I tell myself, you know, there is one of Morgan's roles out there yeah. that, <laughs> that, that maybe could make its uh, way in my direction. And I hope that I can go on dealing with live theater for as long as possible. It gets harder, mm -hmm. um, physically harder. And uh, I have been approached about playing King Lear um, in 20, <laughs> in 2020. The director said, you'll be 80 then, it's perfect. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't know, I really, yeah. really don't know. I'm, I'm actually, for the first time in my damned life, I'm scared. Mm. Because I think maybe I am no longer physically up for it. But I'm, I am going to sit down with Ian over a long dinner one night and say, tell me, what was it like? And do you think I, I could live through it myself? Yeah. So. yeah. Well, as Logan shows, there are just amazing avenues and amazing things all coming around. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Patrick Stewart, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.